Now, how do we use the energy resources? Well, in the U.S., almost 40% go to making electricity. And the ones that are um, very hard to turn off, that just run rock solid, like nuclear power, completely goes into making electricity. Coal also, in the U.S., goes 100% virtually into making electricity. People don't heat their homes with coal anymore. Coal is used in some factories, of course, especially for processes where they need the coke, like in steel making. But predominantly, coal and nuclear make electricity. Now, that's just a transformation of the energy into an end-use sector. Clearly, all that electricity that's made then gets used somewhere else as well. So we like to break down energy use, ultimate energy use, into three categories. Buildings, industry, and transportation. Buildings can be broken into a residential sector and a commercial sector. Each of these have particular ways they use the energy. And if you want to try to make a world where you use energy more efficiently, you first have to know where we use it now. Where can you make the biggest savings? I'm sorry. Let's examine each sector in turn. First, what about industry? What about the big giant factories, right, where the energy comes in, whether you're burning it on site or you're bringing in electricity? What do you use in a factory? Well, I've got the statistics here that show you the percentages, but basically you do two things in a factory. You either heat stuff up or you make it go in circles. I know it sounds a little crazy, but think about big fans or, or turning things or milling things or manufacturing things. Something's turning in a circle, right, using an electric motor. And the other thing you do is you heat stuff up. Maybe you heat up ore to turn it into smelt it. Maybe you heat up soup, right, to turn it into food, to turn it into soup, right? You heat things up. So if you want to save efficiencies in energy, find a better way to, uh, to make things go in circles. Find a more efficient, less energy loss to heat things up. And indeed, that's what's happened. We used to have drive that was not variable. You had a fan going. The motor was going at one constant speed, even when people didn't want the fan on. So what they do is maybe they would uh, put some brake on the shaft, right? Or loosen the coupling. The motor would still be going. This, of course, is very inefficient. You're still using all that energy, even though you're not wanting the end product. So a variable speed drive, one that, that turns and uses just as much electricity as you need for the mode of power in the end, was a tremendous innovation that saved energy and made higher efficiency for factories. The same way with heating. Induction heating can be extremely efficient and all of the heat goes into the product you want as opposed to heating up all the vessels and containers that are around it as well. What else is used in a factory? You still have to work in the place so you need some heating and air conditioning. You got to have some lights on, right? And you've got some other electrical types devices. So those are there, but those are the fairly minor constituents. What about buildings? Let's first look at homes, at residential use. You might imagine, especially if you pay the bills at your home, the number one energy use is to keep the place warm. Space heating. Now, if you live in a tropical climate, you're probably not doing that. Maybe you're using your air conditioning much more or just plain not using a lot of energy in your home. That would be nice, right? But if you're in a place where it gets below room temperature, you're going to have something to heat it back up. So space heating is your number one energy use. After that, in the U.S., cooling and water heating are tied at 12% each. Cooling is important, of course, because it gets very hot in the summer and you want to be able to work. But heating water is also a very large use. Most Americans have a water tank in the basement that's always hot. When I've gone to homes in Europe, I see an at-use water heater. As you use the water, it's heated up on its way to the point where you're using it. 
a much more efficient way of doing that heat than a large tank that's always hot, all the time, losing heat out to the environment. When I've gone to sunny climates, southern Europe, Mexico, you see solar water heaters. Heaters that are on the roof using the sun's energy to provide the hot water. And that's great because then it wouldn't even show up on this type of residential energy use. So after heating, air conditioning, and hot water, the next thing we have are lights. And then your appliances like refrigeration, uh, your electronics, cooking. The difference between a residential building and a commercial building, of course, is a commercial building generally doesn't have to be heated to the same degree when you're not working in it. So while heating is still the highest percentage in a commercial building, it's much less than it would be in a residential one. Cooling, however, is about the same, since if it's too hot to live at home, it's probably too hot to work. So you're going to need to cool it. And then you'll have lights, water heating, the electronics, and all the other things you might use at your place of business. So with 40% going to electricity, 30% going to industries, that leaves 30% left. And that's roughly what is used in transportation. We've got to get around. And almost all of our oil goes into transportation. You can break down the transportation sector. And then U.S. of that energy that goes into transportation, of basically the oil that's used, 60% is used by automobiles, cars. 15% by trucks, and not pickup trucks. I'm talking here about the 18-wheelers, the giant big semi-trailers that are on the road. 15%. And surprisingly, the third highest use is airplanes. The commercial air fleet, the private air fleet, uses 11% of the fuel in America. It's a big country. If you get places, you use planes, and planes are fuel hungry. Now, after that, after the 60, the 15, and 11%, what's next is actually the roads themselves. You don't think of it as an energy use. But when you actually break up oil and you er, end up with the thickest parts, it's very hard to distill. That's still a fuel. That's still an energy resource. If you take that and you mix it with gravel, you get asphalt. And indeed, you can pave the roads with the very oil that your automobile is using to travel on them. After we have roads at 6%, we end up with pipelines. Pipelines are a form of transportation. You actually move stuff. You move fluids, right? Oil through the pipeline. It doesn't just move through the pipeline for free. You've got to spend some energy to push it along. That's 3% of our energy, and that's transportation because you're moving the oil as opposed to putting it on a train, which is another 3% in the U.S. Ships, 1%. Buses, less than a half percent. That's where your energy goes for transportation. Here's another really great graph. It takes the primary energy uses, and it shows how they're broken up into the different sectors that we just discussed. It's got a lot of detail on it. It shows you the percentages going to each place. But if you just need to remember something, we use oil for transportation. We use nuclear and renewables to make electricity, which then gets used in all the sectors. We use natural gas to heat buildings. Now, that 40% of our energy that went into making electricity, where does it come from? Coal in the U.S. is almost solely used for making electricity, and it's our largest source of electric use. 43% of our electricity is made by coal. The next highest use is natural gas. 22% of our electricity is made by natural gas. The 100 operating nuclear power plants in the United States makes 21.7% of the electricity. So now we're well over 80%, and the next highest is hydroelectric. Hydroelectric is 6.5%, and wind, which has really come up from nowhere in the last 20 years, is 4.2% of the electricity in America. We keep going down the list, and we have things that make less than 1%. And unfortunately, we get down to solar, which is more like a couple tenths of a percent. But one can always hope that it will grow more. But those top ones, the coal, the oil, the fossil fuels, it's 
a large percentage of our electricity, a large percentage of our energy uses, that will be very difficult for renewables to make a dent in. Not because there's some conspiracy or the oil companies, the energy companies don't want you to. That's not the reason. It's just the technology and the sheer magnitude. The amount of energy used is so astronomical that the number of windmills, the solar plants, the hydro dams, even as we grow them and build them quickly and install them, can barely keep up with the rate of growth of energy use, let alone overtake the fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are going to be with us for a long time. We certainly want to use them efficiently, but don't kid yourself that somehow we're going to have no more carbon put into the air anytime in the near future. This isn't a history class. It's a class about energy. But it's interesting that you can look at global energy use over time and read off historical events. First one I want to point out is there on the graph the small downturn, at least at this scale, in the 1930s, or right around 1930. That was the Great Depression. Worldwide energy use dropped by a quarter. The second thing is to notice the ratio of the U.S. to the world. The U.S. has just under 5% of the people in the world, and back 50, 60, 100 years ago, we still only had about 5% of the people in the world. Yet, right at the end of World War II, the U.S. was using almost half of the energy in the world. That percentage has slowly decreased because the rest of the world has picked up and grown. In fact, you can see this exponential growth of energy. And this was continuing up, and then the next blip on the chart is in the early 70s. The Arab-Israeli crises that led to the oil embargoes and the quadrupling of the price of oil set a worldwide blip downward in total energy consumption. The next blip happened later that decade, the Iranian Revolution, and yet another price increase and another adjustment as oil became a much more valuable and expensive commodity because of the political instability. And that political instability led to a worldwide energy drop. This then goes on. We go through another decade, and we hit the end of the 80s, 89, 90, and we see another drop. This was the end of the Cold War. This is the fall of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of those Soviet Union into independent countries. Why is there an energy drop when that occurs? Because you've gone from state-controlled enterprises to a rocky start, perhaps, of many capitalist-driven economies, which are much more efficient in terms of their energy use. And finally, from this chart, you can see China's great rise and a blip in upward energy consumption in the early 2000, 2002, 2004, in this range. And that's when China shifted dramatically from a command economy, a communist economy, to a capitalist economy. They might not use that words, but when you allow private property, when you allow profit motive to guide businesses, standards of living, energy use, growth rise dramatically and so does energy use.